this really special program. It's a topic that every pilot is forced to confront at one point or another, the check ride. I'm pretty sure that I'm not the only one that had trouble sleeping the night before a practical test. Anxiety about the test is a common problem for applicants. The best way to combat that is to be prepared, and that means knowing what to expect. Now, that's not too difficult since your entire check ride is spelled out for you in advance in the Airman Certification Standards. Now, think about that. You have a chance to know exactly what will be expected if you'll simply study the ACS. Tonight, Gold Seal is giving you a front row seat on a private pilot practical test oral exam. This will be just like the real deal. Stephen Lee has bravely stepped forward as the applicant. Even though this is a mock exam, it will be conducted just like the real one that he has scheduled in a couple of weeks. Stephen has been training at the Swanson Airport in Washington State with his flight instructor, Andy Swineford. Sitting in the examiner's seat is Todd Shellnut, AOPA's 2015 Flight Instructor of the Year. Todd has conducted thousands of practical tests over the years, and I can't think of a better person to lead this presentation tonight. Todd, thanks for joining us, and, and thanks, thanks for taking time, time out of your busy schedule. I know you have one of those. Thanks, Russ. I appreciate you having me. Okay, over the years, you've done a lot of check rides, and have most of them been primary, most of them been instrument. I know you do everything up to ATP in the past. Yep, everything up to instructor add-ons. So I've done the whole grommet of check rides, everything so from start to finish. This won't be your first rodeo with a no, pilot, pilot not. applicant, will it? My first it? dog and pony show. Okay, well, your, your applicant tonight is going to be Steve Lee. So, Steve, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How about you guys? Great, great. I know I tell you, Steve, uh, uh, I've, I've seen, uh, I can't, although uh, we're not really face-to-face -face right now, and I probably will see your face here in a minute. Oh, there you are. Outstanding. Those two handsome men there. Anyway, uh, you know, it's, when I come across the table to someone as a DPE, the, the anxiety level is just usually the biggest factor to have to get over. Uh, plus, I have this, this face that always looks like I'm mad at the world, which is not really the true thing. <laughs> this thing I had to get over. But you're going to find out today that when we actually go through this, this actually probably, I'll get you pretty relaxed within the first 20 or 30 minutes of it, it may not be exactly right off the bat because just meeting with a DPE in itself can be somewhat um, pose a level of anxiety. But I don't think you're going to have mm -hmm. any problems. We'll go through it pretty smooth and we'll get started here in just a minute. All righty. Okay. Well, you've already uh, looked at, we'll imagine that we've already looked over all his log books, uh, his 8710. You've gotten his paperwork in line. So why don't you just dive right into the ACS and uh, start okay. it. We're going to try to abbreviate this and keep it, at, keep it at about an hour. We can definitely do that. So with that being said, or what about it, Steve? You ready? I'm as ready as I'll ever be. Okay, man. So like Russ said, <laughs> uh, assuming that we've already done things like um, uh, getting into uh, the weight, and, I mean, the, the proving the airplane's airworthy and proving, proving your application and everything is correct, uh, now we can actually get on with the check ride. So what you're going to see here, uh, what I have up on the screen is the uh, copy of the ACS, which we actually deal with. Now, the ACS is divided up into different sections, and we simply just take each section one at a time. And remember that the ACS is meant to be a, a, just a big scenario. So uh, the, today's scenario is going to be that um, you're going to take this flight that you previously planned and you're going to take a family member over to a wedding. And it is very important that you have this family member there uh, on time because they're actually going to be in the wedding and, uh, and you're attending the wedding. So it's very important that, you're, that you have this person there on time. So we're going to really put the whole entire scenario around that entire event that you actually have to be there on time and you're the pilot in command, you're making all the decisions. You good with that? I'm good with that. Okay, bud. So let's get started first. We'll start right off on what we have here called the, um, uh, the pre-flight preparation side and pilot qualification. So again, each question I ask you will be scenario based. So um, again, okay. if, I, if I ask you a question that you don't understand, just ask me that you don't understand or ask me to rephrase the question. That's well within your duty as the applicant to, uh, to when you're talking with the examiner. Just if you don't understand, just ask and I'll help you out, okay? All right. So the first thing we're going to talk about is um, uh, the, the, the pre-flight, the pilot qualification size of things. So as you're at the flight school and you're out uh, by the airplane and you're pre-flight in the airplane, walk around the airplane, maybe even putting some bags in the airplane, uh, an FAA official comes up to you. And the uh, FAA examiner, I mean, the FAA uh, aviation safety inspector comes up to you from the local FISDO and uh, introduces himself. And he says, hey, uh, how are you doing? I'm John Smith from the uh, local FISDO. And 
Uh, are you going to be the pilot? And of course, you would say what? I would say yes, I am. Yeah, absolutely. So then he says, well, if you're going to be the pilot, I'd, I'd like to be able to uh, do a ramp check, quick ramp check on you, and I'd like to see your credentials. So what would you have to show the FAA safety inspector at this time? All right, so there's three things I'd have to show them. Uh, one would be my uh, medical ID. Uh, it's showing that I've got either a class one, two, or three medical. And uh, ID, uh, photo ID, so driver's license, whatever, and also a um, pilot's certificate. So those would be the three things that would, he did basically need to see for me to know whether I was good to fly or not. Good. And so uh, in our airman certification standards, uh, we have to ask one question from the knowledge area. Uh, one question from the risk mm -hmm. management area, one question from the skills area. So you've actually just answered one of the questions from the knowledge area. Now, after the area of operation one, I won't break this down anymore. I'll continue just to go through it. Um, okay. But uh, this is what we're talking about right now is this is line one here, uh, dealing with the certifications, requirements, currency, and record keeping. So based off of that, uh, before this flight today, it's actually been about two weeks since you have flown last. And uh, during those, uh, that last time you flew, you actually just spent about an hour in the pattern doing some touch and goes. It was during the daytime. Um, is that going to be good enough for you to be uh, current for carrying passengers on today's flight? Yes, it is. Why? Is I believe that? the, uh, uh, well, the limit you can go is 90 days without having, you know, if you haven't done any touch and goes within the past 90 days, then you can't haul passengers unless you've done at least three of those. So. Good, good, good. Um, so, although you've you've done some recent flying lately, and you did the two hour the, the, that hour worth in the pattern about two weeks ago, um, tell me about this word proficient versus current. Do you think that you may be proficient for this flight, even though you're current? And what does that mean to you? Proficiency to me basically means that you know whether I can fly. Okay, if I feel like I'm competent to fly whether, you know, in the area I'm going in with the weather I'm going to be having and, you know, even health wise and, you know, how I'm feeling, how much sleep I've got and stuff like that. So that's kind of the proficiency to me is just how good I'll fly, you know, how good my landings are, how good my radio communications with the control towers are. And if they're not good, I would definitely want to brush up on those before and or just, you know, in just I guess as I'm going for the flight there, I would even just study up on it at least some. Good. Good. Now, um, it seems as that you're going to be gone all day on this trip, and uh, your return flight is actually going to be at night on the way back. Tell me about these takeoff and landings that you did at the airport during the day a few weeks ago. How, is that, how will that help you with your night currency? It will not help my night currency at all uh, to be current at night. I've got to have three full stop landings at night um, within the past 90 days as well. So it's the same thing as, you know, the day flying, but you need full stop landings. Good, good, good. All right. So uh, with our risk management side of things, uh, you've basically already told me your uh, difference between your, uh, your proficiency and currency. So I'm satisfied with your definition of that and we can move on to the skill level uh, side of things. Um, so under the requirements to act as PIC for this visual flight, uh, you said you have to have some documents on you which you've already told me that. Um, would there be anything else that you would do? Or I'll tell you what, why don't you just go ahead and tell me everything that you would have to have to, to be PIC for this flight in addition to your certificates. Would you have to maintain the currency? I do. I would have to have at least a biannual flight review. Uh, so every two years, I'd have to have one of those. Um, as far as I can think of right now, that's basically the only thing you have to have. And of course, you've got to be able to fly the plane. So if it's a twin engine, you have to be twin engine rated and that kind of stuff. Yep, and of course, since we're just doing it today, and a, uh, is it a Cessna that we're using, Stephen? Yes, Cessna 170. Since it's just a Cessna, we don't even have to worry about that because it's just one engine, so we're good to go on that. Perfect. Um, let's talk about uh, the next stage of our check ride, which is going to be our area of operation one, task B, which is airworthiness. Let's talk a bit, little about that. Okay. So now the 
inspector that you were talking with out on the ramp, Stephen. He has mm -hmm. uh, seen your, your paperwork, but he's getting a look at the aircraft and he wants to know about the aircraft and is the aircraft airworthy? And so tell me about general airworthiness requirements and compliance for airplanes, especially the aircraft you'll be using. What would you need to, what are some of the things that you would probably need to show that uh, in safety inspector? All right, one of the things would be uh, just the airworthiness certificate that comes with the plane. Um, you'd have to be registered both federally and state. Um, you've got to have the POH in the plane to be able to operate it at all times with that. And then you've got, you have to have your weight and balance logs filled out on that. And I don't know um, if I'm just running the plane like that, I would, I doubt I would have the engine logs and the uh, airframe logs with me or he could look in that. But, uh, those would be another place you could look out just to make sure that things are worthy as well. Good. So I mean, you mentioned something about an airworthiness certificate. Can you tell me a little bit about that and, and does it expire? No, an airworthiness certificate never expires, um, but it is not valid if your airplane is down because it has been deemed by an IA or an EMP that it is not airworthy at the time. But if you get it fixed and get it back up in the air, then it uh, goes back to being valid. Good. What about the registration? What, what is a registration and how long is it good for? If I remember my numbers correctly, it's going to be good for two years. For how long was and, that? Uh, two years. Two years. I believe. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not positive on that, but that's what's on the top of my head for that. It is a little bit longer, but we'll talk about that after the check ride. Okay. That's how an examiner should respond to your question. He can't tell you whether you're right or whether you're wrong or shouldn't, but if you do happen to get a question and it is not correctly, because up to them they can either talk <laughs> about it or discuss it, but uh, it's three years is actually really what it is. Three years. Okay. Okay, so uh, again, in the check ride, the examiner can't teach. This is meant to be a very close to a check ride, so I'm actually going to ad lib a little bit and kind of okay. and kind of assist you a little bit. But understand, then the check ride, the examiner can't do any teaching, so you may not know that you actually get questions wrong. So, okay, but sometimes that's good for your anxiety levels too, is not knowing that you're getting questions wrong. So you said airworthiness registration, and tell me about this POH thing. Do we have to have that in the airplane? Yes, we do. Now, the POH is basically going to go over all your um, airplane specifications as far as what your best glide is if you have an engine failure. Um, it's going to tell you, you know, your ratios of climb, what that is, best climb for different things. And it's going to have your cruise performance and stuff like that. And so it is required by the FAA to have that in your airplane at all times. Good. So I, I noticed you have this other book with you. It's uh, called a pilot information manual or... It's like a copy of the POH, I guess, that you've been using to study with. Is that okay to mm -hmm. use also in the airplane for that? It is. Uh, it is uh, copied directly out of the POH, but um, I can use it in the airplane as long as the POH stays in there as well. Yep. So you just want to make sure that you don't replace that POH with your copy of it because there's only one Correct. copy of the POH and that's the only one that's legal for the aircraft, okay? Okay. Now, tell me about this weight and balance. Is that like um, is that like the weight and balance with you and I in the airplane, or what, what weight and balance does the FAA want to see? Uh, the weight and balance they want to see is basically the empty weight of that plane, and of course it's going to have add-ons on it. Uh, if the AMP does adds anything on as far as radios and stuff, it'll have that figured into it. Good. Where, where can I normally find the weight and balance data for this airplane? Well, for us, we have uh, kind of like a dispatch book, so it's a, in a binder, as, um, and every, all our information is in there as far as, you know, POH, we've got the weight and balance sheets and everything in there. So that's where we keep ours. Okay, good. So you've showed that the FA inspector this information. They are more than satisfied with this information that you are showing them. And the safety inspector says, okay, have a good flight. We'll see you later on. And you say, hopefully not. And then, <laughs> then he leaves. <laughs> and uh, so let's, uh, let's talk about your pre-flight. So you're doing some pre-flight uh, around the airplane, walk around the airplane. And you see that upon your initial 
pre-flight for this day flight that your landing light is not working. Um, is that going to be a showstopper for you on today's flight? No, it's not. Uh, landing light actually is not going to be required by any uh, by the FAA to fly, with, fly whether uh, night or day, unless you are renting the aircraft from somebody else. Okay. So, uh, in this particular case, uh, we have noticed something that is inoperative on the airplane. What is your responsibility as a pilot in command for this particular equipment that you have found to be inoperative? What would you have to do in order, in order to stick with the regs and make sure everything's in compliance? Uh, one thing I'd have to do would be just to check and make sure that it's something that I can do without if on the flight as far as, you know, legally I be checking in the manuals or the FARs or something like that to find out if I can legally fly without that piece of equipment. And normally if it's a VFR flight, you can fly with something in op. Okay. So would you need to do anything in, inside the aircraft or anything to like the light switch for that landing light to ensure that you I, maintain the legality of that inoperative equipment? I would. I would put a sticker on it that says in-op uh, on it okay. just so, you know, I don't accidentally turn it on and short something okay. out. Good. All right, good. So we'll talk about, uh, talk about that and let's look at some other things here. So it says in the, in the ACS now, if we look back at the ACS, we can see that we've completed the risk management side of things. You've told me that the landing light is not a big deal for the day flight and it's not a legal requirement. So uh, I'm, I'm good to go with that. Uh, we did talk about this airplane coming back at night would be a factor. And uh, although not required unless you're renting, do you think that you as a pilot, uh, would make this flight if you knew the landing light was inoperative? Depending on how late at night I'd be coming back and also with the urgency of the situation of having to get there, uh, me personally, if the runway has lights where I'm going to be landing at, I wouldn't be worried so much about a landing light being out. Okay. Um, if it was a runway that didn't have much light, I definitely want to get that fixed first. All right, so you'd probably get it fixed first before you made the night flight, right? That is correct on the, yeah, if correct. there's no lights That's yet. That's a good decision to make, Stephen. <laughs> Outstanding, good job. <laughs> so let's talk about now about some skills that you would have to have for this airworthiness requirements. So let's see what the ACS says. All right. You've already told me about the airworthiness and registration, but uh, where is this located at inside the aircraft? The airworthiness and registration is usually located on the uh, side panel of the airplane on the pilot's side, uh, usually about knee level, or that's how it is anyways on the planes we fly. Um, right. That's usually where they're located at. Yeah. So do they have to be visible? Yes, they do. Good. Good deal. So in this particular scenario where we do have this particular landing light that is inoperative, um, is the aircraft airworthy? For this day flight? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Good. Now, um, it says here that we actually have to um, look at some procedures for operating with inoperative equipment. So as you're looking through the this box of uh, things that the flight school gives you or wherever you're renting from and uh, has everything on there, like maybe a squawk sheet, like things that are wrong with the airplane, and you actually see inside of this, all this paperwork that's with the, that's with the aircraft, that the transponder has been actually been labeled as it's not working. So the squawk may read something like transponder stopped working on last flight. If we're looking at your, uh, your whole, in, your, your route that you're doing today, which if we can look at the, uh, the route here on the screen, we can see that uh, that you're actually going to be flying from this uh, two whiskey three over to Hotel Quebec Mike. So along this route today that you actually see here at your planned altitude, Steve, would you actually need a transponder for this flight today? No, I would not. The only time I need a transponder is within Class B or C airspace. Okay, good. Uh, what would be some of the 
the positive uses, I mean, even though you don't have a transponder that's, that's operable, uh, what would be some of the, the good reasons to actually have a transponder, though? Uh, one of them would be having flight following. Um, even as you're flying, they can tell you if there's other planes in the area or they can just track you as you go in case you crash. Yep, that's always a good thing to have the transponder know where you are, especially an ELT in the event of a, a crash, like you said. Hopefully you would never have to, to deal with that, but uh, if it does mm -hmm. happen, the, the transponder would help you actually to get there. So um, that would be the satisfying the remark for operating within operative equipment. Let's move on to the next uh, section of the check ride, which actually going to start talking about your weather. Uh, you've got some weather charts that you have printed out and you have shown me. So let's, uh, first off, let's just look at some very basic things first. And I, it seems to me as an examiner, whenever I'm asking someone about weather, I get all different types of answers in regards to where they get their weather from. So where do you get your weather from, Steve? Uh, I get it from a couple different places. Uh, normally, it's either on Sky Vector and just looking at the different airports and just seeing what the weather is right at the vicinity. And I can also pull up some wind barbs and some radar stuff. Uh, for flight has got basically the same thing, maybe a little bit easier to use on that. But then I also go to uh, aviationweather.gov, I believe it is, and find out some more weather from them. And I can usually change that to basically get whatever I need. Have you ever called a weather briefer? I have not. That's, that's probably something that your CFI would probably want to go over with you. That's a very valuable tool. It's all, the difference between that and looking at other things is that the briefer is a real live person. And so if you actually don't understand something while you're looking at your weather briefing, you actually have a live person that you can actually ask, hey, what does that mean? And they're, they're pretty good people with understanding this weather. They get paid to understand this weather. Uh, some of them mm -hmm. are pilots, some of them are not, but what we really want to get into the question, the scenario I want to ask you is what do you think is an acceptable source of weather data when you're out, uh, weather data when you're out for flight planning purposes? And would that mean where you just maybe on the way out the door, you heard the weatherman say it was going to be a, a beautiful day today and you look outside and you see everything's good to go. Would, do you think that would be good enough for you to actually go and actually perform a flight in an airplane? No, I don't. Like I always say, they're the ones who get paid to lie. So I don't, <laughs> I normally don't go by what they say. Yeah. But uh, I think when we get a weather briefing, we also get some other things besides just the weather from these briefers, don't we? We do. We uh, usually get, uh, you know, winds and fronts and stuff coming in. Uh, you can see that. You can see basically where it's going to be bad weather and where it's not going to be. Yeah. So that's, and they do a really good job of getting the weather, but besides the weather, do they give you anything else besides the weather? Like maybe some notices, which would be very important to, let's say, airmen? They, I guess they would, they, um, and that would be just, you know, if there's any th thunderstorms in the area, uh, hail, stuff like that, they would let you know, as well as pie reps and stuff, you know, what other yeah. pilots have forecasted and given to them. Good, yes, if we just kind of stuck our head out the door, we couldn't be, we wouldn't be able to hear about things such as pie reps and those things called notums. If mm -hmm. the president, uh, our current president is in the uh, air, or very close to the area, you would probably want to know about that stuff, right? Yes, I would. Yeah, because your brand new certificate will be forfeited if you penetrated a presidential TFR. Very high probability. Mm -hmm. I'm not an aviation safety inspector. I couldn't say that for a fact. So, it's, uh, would you say that it's very? Would you say that it's very important to have some definitely some source of acceptable source of weather data? I would say it's very important. I would that. say that would be a very very important thing. So let's look down at some of these risks that would be involved. Uh, what does our ACS say in regards to uh, the risk that would be involved with this? Um, so we're looking at some weather reports that you have. And uh, if we'll look here on the, uh, on the screen, we have some weather reports here. And this particular weather report here is uh, it's a good weather report because we can use this weather report for multiple different things. 
This is our winds and temps aloft chart. So as we get into talking about the weather, that can actually help us when we're starting to plan our nav log as well. So I'm looking at the, um, the weather here and of course, you'll have to help me out, Steve, and tell me which one of these identifiers on the left-hand side of this chart that I'm looking at, this winds and temps aloft chart, are going to be the airports that you're going to use for your winds and temps aloft data so I can follow along with you. All right. The, uh, basically, the only one that I would use is Seattle, and that's the second one up from the bottom. Uh, that's the closest one I've found to the area that uh, has got the, about the same weather. Okay. So... <clears throat> on your flight today, we can see that uh, on your flight that you have uh, chose an altitude of what? Is that 3,000 feet, correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, and would that be a proper altitude for direction of flight? It would be. Um, it doesn't, as long as you're 3,000 feet and below, you don't have to. Uh, be like the, uh, you know, if you're heading west, you have to be an even 4,000 plus 500 and east exactly. That is opposite. good. So that's very good. A lot of people don't know that, Stephen. That's very good. If you're, if you're operating at or below 3,000 feet AGL, that uh, then the cardinal rules of flying don't apply to you. Very good. So mm -hmm. let's look at your winds and temps alive chart for Seattle. And if you could, could you read me the winds for 3,000 at Seattle? Yes, it is 21 knots at 350. Yep, so uh, 21, uh, say that one more time for me, just to make sure I understood you correctly. All right, 21 knots at, uh, coming out of 350. If I'm sorry, <laughs> 210 coming at 35 knots. I like that answer better. I think that's the more appropriate answer. Yep, winds of 210 <laughs> yeah. at 35 knots is what we actually want to look for on that particular one. And just for informational purposes, since you kind of hiccup a little bit on that, can you go ahead and read mm -hmm. me the winds for 6,000 as well for Seattle? Yeah, 6,000 for Seattle uh, coming from 230. Uh, they're coming at 34 knots. And what's that outside air temperature there, Steve? Uh, zero 05 Celsius. Yep. Minus zero 05 Celsius. Positive or negative? Negative on that. Negative. Very good. Okay. So that's uh, one of the weather charts that we want to use. And um, what are some reasons for us looking at this winds and temps of live chart? Why would this chart be important to you as a pilot? Feel free to name as many reasons as you like. Okay. Um, though mainly the number one reason I want to know what the winds are going to be up high is uh, how much field burn I'm going to have. Um, you know, uh, with this with this winds up that high right now in the direction I'm going it's going to be basically a direct headwind, which is going to make the, my fuel burn a lot more. Okay. What about anything else? Anything else? Uh, like I said, feel free to name as many as you like. I'm trying to get at least two or three out of you. <laughs> All right. So, so with the, uh, data, that's a good one. So you'll know how fast you're going to be going across the ground. That's a pretty good one. What else? Yeah. So I can drag uh, it out of you. What about that temperature thing? Is yeah. that important to you? It is. It is important, although it's because it's going to increase your engine performance up that high um, with that cold temperature. It, it'll definitely increase your performance by a slight bit. Right. Well, I know that the Seattle um, area is a relatively dry area. Is that correct? No, it's not. You get lots of icing if you... It's not. Yeah. So if I see these negative temperatures up close to where I'm going to be going, and I know that the local weather in my area is for, you know, very uh, uh, predominantly kind of very moist and rainy area, would that be a factor mm -hmm. for our aircraft today? It would be. Uh, you don't... If you go up too high and it gets too cold, you're going to be in pretty good icing conditions. Good. Which that so, right there with that weather will be in the clouds. Yep, perfect. So we've talked about our performance for our airplane. We've also talked about we could possibly see where maybe some icing conditions would be. Um, can you think of anything else? Uh, the other thing would just be like wind shear turbulence, stuff like that. You know, if it gets too windy, just kind of blowing your plane around. And if it's too bad, it can damage the plane in areas. Okay, good, good. So let's look at uh, some, some other charts to see uh, what kind of weather we're looking at along our route. 
And I think the other chart I'd like to look at is uh, the one that actually covers your METARs here. So uh, if right. you're looking at that particular chart there, um, again, yep. you're going to have to walk me through uh, the these METARs here. I, I think I see Hotel Quebec Mike, and I don't see uh, the airport you're leaving from, but is, is it from Tacoma Narrows in that area? Where is it? Down below? That's just south of Tacoma? It, uh, it's southeast of Tacoma, so if you go to uh, KPLU, it would be so right about 10 miles directly south. Good. So if we're looking at the chart here on the big screen, we can see that uh, Steve's flight is going to be originating from right up here around the PLU area in this area. That's up in the upper uh, right-hand quadrant there, uh, PLU, and it's a straight shot, basically some couple of bends right over here to Hotel Quebec Mike, and let's look at uh, his chart. You can see there uh, where the airport is and how his route goes straight up to Hotel Quebec Mike. All right, so let's go back and look at these METARs. So when you have a chance, if you would, um, are you familiar with actually looking at these station models like this? Would you feel comfortable reading me the METAR off of a station model, Steve? I would, uh, slightly. I'll probably get some of it wrong, of course, but uh, I do know as, uh, as far as like the wind barbs and stuff like that, I do know that as in, you know, your temperature and your visibility. Well, why don't you so. do, do the best job you can? And if not, we'll probably, probably try to find something else or we can just... We'll bypass this, but just do the best okay. you can and tell me for PLU, what are we looking at for PLU? What is that, what is that station model telling you? A station model is telling me that the uh, clouds are scattered right now at about 4,600 uh, feet. Um, you've got a, your winds are coming from 390 and uh, you have about 15 knot wind there coming out of that one. Um, your altimeter setting is going to be at, uh, 990 and, uh, let's see, your temperature is 46 and, oh, uh, come on. It's hard to see on this one. I'm not quite pulling everything yeah. up, but, uh, so, yeah, you know, that's about all I have. You're looking at, uh, with a DPE and, in, in the, on the check ride is, Sometimes the answers are literally right in front of you. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, if you were being very astute, uh, you could probably have seen already that the answers are in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, right? That's what I was trying to do, but it was yeah. pulling up yeah. on my iPad. So the good thing about <laughs> most of these weather charts, if we actually get a bona fide weather chart in front of us, unless it's been modified, you can actually read most of the answers just right off the weather chart. Where it becomes a yeah. problem is if you're looking at some of these weather charts that are in uh, ForeFlight or any of the other uh, mass-produced uh, items here that we use for pre-flight planning, they actually don't have a lot of the, uh, of the features, uh, decoding features on there, so you kind of really need to know what you're looking at. So mm -hmm. um, along our route here, you said 2,400 foot scattered. Is that 2,400 uh, foot scattered MSL or AGL? Uh, 2,400, that is going to be, that's going to be AGL. AGL, very good. You had a 50-50 yeah. shot, Steve. You got it. <laughs> I did. I was just trying to, I was just trying to recall all my studies there. So. I, hey, I, I understand. <laughs> it's, uh, CFI, have to learn about it all the time. It's actually called recall failure. So, you're mm -hmm. doing good to have recalled as much as you have already. So, Keep up the good work. Let's okay. uh, let's look at our just overall um, weather from here to HQM. Just if we're looking at just these METARs here, Steve, mm -hmm. what do you think about the weather going from here to HQM? Good or eh, not so good? It's going to be kind of mediocre. It's going to be heavy winds flying. As uh, although our ceiling is going to be high enough, that's going to be you know, roughly around 4,500 feet, and we're going to be flying at 3,000. So as far as that, we are going to be good with that, although it's going to be a pretty good headwind. Yep. Absolutely agree. We could use some, some other weather charts uh, just for time restriction. We're not going to try to get too involved in this uh, with this with the weather charts and everything, but just because just we want to try to do as much of this as possible for the viewers 
uh, own benefit and your benefit as well. So we're actually going to click over, I mean, look at some other things. We'll actually just go back and look at our chart. But um, so with the weather that you're going here, it looks to be a pretty good flight today. Um, so we've already talked about some of the weather sources that you would use uh, involved with that. And uh, some factors, let's talk about some factors involved in making that go, no go decision. So what would be some things at your level, at your stage as a pilot, like a brand new certificated pilot, what would be some things on your end, if you're looking at the weather, that you would look at the weather and you'd be like, nope, I'm not going? Uh, one of the things would be if at the uh, airport I'm heading to, if it had some pretty good crosswinds there, I probably wouldn't go landing on that one. Uh, I'd you know, either find a different airport or wait a little bit or something. Um, but currently as it is, it's going to be almost a direct headwind, which is going to make landing pretty easy. Uh, a couple other things I'd be looking at is if the ceiling was any lower, I would uh, kind of hesitate to do that because you, with the route of the one, you don't want to go too low with that, with uh, some mountainous country there, uh, just little hills and stuff. Um, as far as I know, that would be about the only thing that would keep me from going is uh, with clouds being too low or too much of a crosswind at the airport I'm going to. Yeah, so there's only a couple of things in aviation weather that we probably need to be on top of more than anything else, and that is the winds, uh, the clouds, and the visibility. And that's really what kind of mm -hmm. holds us up as a pilot from going forward is those three things. That's just the top three answers on the board, Steve. Um, so we've already talked about what type of weather sources that you use. Uh, let's talk about um, along your route, although the weather looks very nice along your route, uh, you see that after you get past that last, that middle ways METAR there, that there's actually a large fire uh, that's just south of you, and the, the winds are blowing the fire right across your route, and it is really starting to affect your ability to see your landmarks on your nav chart, and you're just having a lot of problems seeing where you are currently going right now. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is a, it is something that you would actually find on a weather uh, report, but it wasn't on the weather report when you talked to a briefer or either got your weather through ForeFlight or whatever, whatever source you're using. So tell me as a pilot, how would you handle this phenomenon, this smoke that's blowing across your route and it's basically making it almost IFR for you? How would you handle that? Uh, well, depending on how big it would be, I would uh, either go around it, try and go around it down to the south of it. If the wind is blowing it up towards towards me and I'm north of it, I I you know try and go down below. So it looks uh, pretty thick. It, you know, just climb on it. It looks okay. pretty thick down south. Um, but there seems to be like a an airport off your right hand side, just a little bit before we get to that halfway point. Um, what's the name of that airport? Olympia? Olympia. Olympia. Yeah. So let's look at Olympia and see about Olympia Airport. That looks like it's right there along your route. Um, the smoke is just getting really thick. So um, if you decided to just kind of abort your flight and land at Olympia, what would you need to do to land at Olympia? Well, some of the things I would have to do was, of course, talk to the control tower uh, before coming into them. And I would also be listening on their ATIS and get their ATIS information and have that beforehand, way before I fly into the airport and contact the controlling tower. Um, and with that, it's just um, you know basically contacting the tower and also having an airport diagram available to me real quick to know where to go after I get off the runway. Good. So, um, do you know what this process is called when we actually get off of our route and start to go someplace else that's kind of unplanned? It would be called a diversion. A diversion, yep. The diversion is kind of that one thing that whenever I'm out on a check ride and doing check rides, uh, when I used to do check rides, everybody would have problems with this particular one, but it's just, it's just a 
It's just that you're second guessing what's going on. It's perfectly safe. It's perfectly part of risk management and aeronautical decision making. So let's talk mm -hmm. about the diversion and exactly how you would make that diversion. So um, is this airplane equipped with a GPS? It is not. It's just, uh, it's got the basic six pack and then it's got an ILS and a VOR in it. So did you, I'm sorry, I really couldn't hear you. Did you say that it was equipped with a GPS or not? No, it's not. It's not. Okay. Even better. I like that. So um, do you plan on using a heads down display? You plan on using an iPad on this route? Uh, if I'd be flying myself, I would, but uh, flying with my DP, I would not. I'd just be using charts and what I've drawn out yeah, and stuff. Yeah, cool. Uh, well, I like to hear that. I like I like that uh, in the way of the wave of the future, the way of the future here. I like to hear people still sticking with the paper side of things. So the first thing we do when we do a diversion is to look and see where we would actually be heading to. Uh, tell me how you would do that as a pilot. How would you look and see what heading you would need to be heading without uh, just looking down at your chart without putting a plotter on it? How would you do that? Um, well, for me, flying that close to Olympia, you're going to be able to see it. And I, I know where it's at, of course, flying that area. So I wouldn't have a problem with that. But if I wouldn't know, and it's been very strange to me, I would look on my chart and I would see that Olympia does have a VOR and I've got a VOR in my airplane. So I would just uh, tune my VOR to the Olympia channel, listen to the identifier, and then uh, turn my VOR to pick up the correct heading and make sure it's uh, on the two heading and not the from and uh, fly the heading that the VOR would give me. Yep, I like that. There's a VOR right there on the field. It's an easy way for you to go directly to it. Uh, you can also just ballpark it, just kind of look and see, oh, it's kind of a yeah. northbound heading. You can do that. Um, back in the day, we used to have come within so many degrees of the heading. They kind of dissuaded, the FA did away with that a few years back. But, um, but that is, that would get you going directly to that particular uh, airport, and that's good. So that's the VOR usage there, and that's exactly what I wanted you to tell me about. So let's look at some other things now. Um, we've pre-flighted the weather, we've pre-flighted the aircraft, but I'm really concerned with, with you and pre-flighting you. How can you pre-flight yourself as a pilot? Well, some of the ways I can pre-flight myself as a, as a pilot is just going over the, uh, well, there's an acronym for that called I'm safe. And that's just basically trying to find out, trying to put yourself on a list, kind of like a checklist as you do for your airplane to make sure you're all good. And, um, you, you know, one of those is, you know, if you're ill, you probably don't want to fly because your judgment isn't going to be that great. And the same goes with medication, lack of sleep. If you've got a lot of anxiety piling up on you, it does affect your decision making in the air. Um, you want to be, have food in your body because if you don't, then, That'll also deprive you of your brain slightly because it'll be working on some other stuff and just with external pressure from other sources. So that's, you know, that's some things I'd pre-flight myself on just to make sure I'd be ready to go and up for the challenge. Good deal. Good deal. Okay. So now that we've kind of got all that, let's, we've talked about the weather. We've talked about your, uh, yourself, your pre-flight yourself. We've talked about the aircraft. The aircraft seems to be airworthy. Um, we want to be able to make sure that what we're planning from our airport to our destination is actually going to get us there. So with that, let's mm -hmm. turn to your nav log and let's look over some things with your nav log. So I'm looking at your nav log here on the screen. And right now, we just want to just kind of talk about the, the, the first leg of your route. So mm -hmm. if you would, talk with me about how you designed your first leg of your route and tell me how you got the items in each one of those boxes, how you derived the, that information. All right, well, it was a progress, but uh, I got it. Um, so first of all, I was looking at my map uh, going from Swanson Field to Hope William and uh, Flying along that route, I, uh, I can fly direct to it, but I'm not going to. I'm going to fly, uh, deviate a little bit south there. And that way I miss the MOA that's right there in the area, as well as stay out of Olympia Class D airspace. 
And so I, I came down to a little town called Tenaino right on the bottom of Olympia. And uh, that's, you know, where I kind of, I'm going to kind of cut a corner and go up just a little bit to get some other areas. But uh, just looking over the map there and the route I traced out there, I, what I'm looking for is any obstacles, what the heights are of those obstacles to determine what my altitude is going to be at, at that route with the weather being the way it is. And then just, you know, on the weather charts that I had found, I put down all my weather information, winds, the velocity of the winds, the temperature, um, and then just calibrated my air speeds, my true course heading, did those little deviations that come with that. And uh, yeah, I got my compass heading. So that's how I got those things. Okay, good. Um, let's look at your, this first leg. You said that this first leg was going to be around 11 miles. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So if you arrived at your first checkpoint and you, it took you 15 minutes to get there, would, would you be alarmed by that? Would that cause any, any issues with you? It would cause a lot of issues with me because, you know, to start off with, it was only supposed to be almost nine minutes to get there. So that would mean that I've got a lot bigger headwind than I had thought I would have. Okay. So um, if we went past each one of these checkpoints and each one of these checkpoints, you were around three to five minutes behind on each checkpoint and you had only planned on being at your destination with the, uh, with the minimum fuel that you needed to be legal for VFR flight on board, would that bother you? It would bother me. I would have to swing either north or south of my route, basically midfield, and grab some fuel either out of Olympia or Chehalis, which would be to the south of me. Good. So the bottom line is, is that when in doubt, you should just always do what? You should always uh, stop and fuel up. Yep. Or just, always you, divert. You know, if you're in, if you're yep, in always doubt, divert. always divert. That's good. Uh, so that's good with the information. We could probably go through a little bit more detailed information on each one of those boxes. And some examiners may want to actually ask you questions like what is true course? What is true heading? What is magnetic heading? Again, the check ride's not really supposed to be an old question and answer style PTS style check ride. It's supposed to be scenario based. But in essence here, I think that you have enough information to cover that line one. I see that you have your your, na your mileage and your time en route and your estimated fuel burn and how much fuel is going to left on board. So the scenario that I gave you would actually, you'd have plenty enough fuel by the time you got to your destination. You wouldn't be in jeopardy or rolling out. But I did have to try to change that around with the scenario so that way I could yeah. examine you on whether or not you knew about the fuel stuff. Um, would you change anything about this flight or altitude today if you were, say, in mountainous terrain? I would. If it would be really mountainous terrains and not just uh, low rolling hills, I would definitely have a higher elevation to fly at as well as have flight following going with me as I'm going over mountainous terrain. Good. Um, so... How low do you think on this cross country? I mean, if, if you had to go actually go down low, you know, due to this heavy smoke that's going across and you decided not to divert, how low would you actually take this airplane down in altitude? Is there something on the chart or something that we could use to kind of help us understand where a safe altitude would be? Uh, there is, and you can, of course, look at your direct route once it's on there. Um, exactly what's going to be your obstacle if you follow the route, you know, give or take 10 miles on either side. But uh, another way you can look at it is if you look at the chart and you've got some big numbers printed in blue and those are your highest obstacles in that area of your latitude and longitudinal lines. So that's, that's one way you can tell, you know, where that biggest obstacle is. And then of course you can look on that to find out exactly where it's at. So right there south of Olympia, there's a 1-9. What can you tell me about that number? That means that's the height of the highest obstacle in that uh, latitude-longitude square that that's in. 
Did you say that? Did you say that was an MSL? Is that what you said? Oh, I did. Sorry, I didn't say whether it was MSL or not. But yes, it is MSL. Okay, good. It is an MSL. So it's actually the the altitude of the highest obstacle rounded to the nearest hundred plus a hundred. Just to let you know that a lot of people don't know that okay. kind of old school info. Um, let's look at some some other things that we have here on the chart so I can test your knowledge of the, of the sectional. So if you'll okay. stay with me, uh, we're going to bring up the, the chart here and look at the chart and I'm going to point out some very specific things. So hopefully you can see where the mouse pointer is. We're still around that, that one nine that is just South of Olympia. Uh, but we'll look at some things. Uh, there's another number right here. It says 735 and 214 in parentheses. What can you tell me about that? All right, so my understanding on that is you're the base of that obstruction. Well, okay, sorry, to start off, the top of it is going to be 735 feet low. And I am not 100% positive on this, but either the obstacle itself is going to be 214 feet high, or then that is going to be your mean sea level. Uh, that's going to be your altitude at mean sea level for the ground that yep. it's at. That is absolutely correct. That top number is what you're going to see on your altimeter when you hit it. And that bottom number is how far you're going to fall to the ground after you do. We don't want to think right. about it that way, but that's, uh, <laughs> that's how we joke about it in the industry. If you like to joke like that. There's another, oh, uh, this town here, and of course I may actually massacre the name of this town here, but is it Tonino? It's Tonino. Tonino. There seems to be like a magenta colored flag popping out of the out of that. What is that all about? That would be a reporting station coming into Olympia Regional, you know, as you're in touch with the tower coming in. That's like a checkpoint that you can tell them, you know, this is where I'm at. And uh, it just kind of gives them a heads up, know how far out you are and exactly okay. where you're at. Good. Let's look at some, some other, th other things that are along your route here. Uh, these things may be a little simple, but uh, just see see where your mindset is. There yes. is this little black uh, thing running down here with these little tick marks on it. What What is that? That would be a railroad track. Good. Those things are easy to, to follow, right? Yes, they are. Yeah. What about this double grade line right here? That would be short. interstate. That? That's interstate 5 running up through there. Yep. So that's also a good way to get to Olympia there, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, that would be IFR, I follow roads. <laughs> or if you were on the railroad, it would be IFRR, which is I follow railroads. Yeah. So there's another um, line that, uh, that we're going to look at, and it's way over here in the right-hand corner of the chart. It has a 16E on it, and what is that? Those are the isogonic lines you have, and that's basically your deviation uh, according to your location from North Pole to where your actual magnetic heading is going to be. Yeah, is, is that important to you for this route? It is very important to me for that route. Otherwise, I am going to be very far yeah. away from my, my actual destination. It is very important. Down here in the south, uh, we really don't have a lot to, to deal with on that. Three, four around Georgia, and uh, we'd probably still get to our destination with no problem. But 16 degree of, of deviation would, uh, lines of variation there, that would be a pretty good, a pretty good uh, snag foo there if we'd had to do that. Um, yes, let's look up here, just a couple more items here. Um, and that is right off of your, where, where Rainier, that's not Mount Rainier, is it? Rainier. No, it's not. It's just a little town called Rainier okay. that's right there. What are these, um, these little magenta combed areas here? Those would be military MOA areas. Can you fly and through those that? Are, yes, you can fly through that. Um, and it'd probably be, you know, if, if you want to know whether it's going to be in use or not, you just either call Seattle Tower and find out if they're in use um, or just contact the controlling tower for that MOA and 
ask them for permission to fly through. Now you don't have to do that, but it's going to be at your own risk. Good deal. Now, this is part of the exam where I could just really spend a lot of quality time with you uh, because there's just so many questions on these sectional charts that pilots uh, don't get asked a lot or they, they really should know it. Uh, mm -hmm. However, we are limited to an hour and just as the time travel goes through check rides, you have actually spent an hour with an examiner. So hopefully you feel proud of yourself. A couple of snags there, but I don't think it's anything that would inhibit you from having a private pilot certificate. And with that, I'm going to turn the show back over to our friend Russ, and he'll close us out. Okay, Steve, you did a great job, and kudos for you for going out in front of tens of millions of people on live television and pulling your pants down for everyone. I think you did a great job. You've got your real check ride coming forward. I hope this has really gave you a preview on what kind of thing you can expect. Uh, Todd's done these, mm -hmm. a lot of them. He did abbreviate this for you, but I hope this really gave you a, a preview of what to expect. So thanks again for did. coming here and, and doing that. I'm sure everybody got a lot, a lot of, out of it. Uh, Todd, and to you, thank you again for coming. Thank you, Russ. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to share this knowledge with people. Okay. Just an area that we we really need help on in the industry to kind of break that anxiety level of that check ride. I got you. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing your evening with us, everyone. We do a lot of these live streams, and they only succeed because of you. We understand how fortunate we are to have you as a member of our flying community. Gold Seal offers complete online training programs, and we are proud to tell you that we are number one on the internet. In fact, we were the very first company to offer an online private pilot ground school. Since then, we have delivered over 4 million private pilot lessons to over 70,000 student pilots. And a few instructors out there make a note. CFIs join for free at Gold Seal and monitor their students' progress online. For private pilot, instrument pilot, or even remote pilot, come to Gold Seal and take a look. See for yourself how we offer you something completely different. For Gold Seal, I'm Russ Still. Thanks for joining us tonight. Good night and good flying. Pass your written test and your check ride with Gold Seal, the Internet's number one ground school. Take a free test drive today and see how much fun learning to fly can be at onlinegroundschool.com.